Hi, welcome to this talk on the common mistakes that you should watch out for as you transition to serverless. But first, let me take you down my memory lane and talk about how things used to work back in the day. And we're only talking about 10 years ago when I used to work for a bank in Canary Wharf in the UK and I used to attend meetings like this except there was no windows and daylight. And what was special about some of these meetings was that we would talk about how we were going to get a new server in three months' time. And that was pretty typical of the kind of procurement time frame that we used to talk about. And of course, everyone would rejoice and be really happy that we're finally going to get a new server added to our data center. We have to talk about how we're going to set up this new server, all the different dependencies we need to install on it. And those discussions were always a bit awkward because everyone's code runs on the same server. So managing dependencies was always a bit of a mess. And we have come a long way since those days. And personally, I have gone from running applications on premises to running stuff on VMs in the cloud to containers to now pretty much only work with serverless technologies like AWS Lambda. And as we move up the abstraction level, I find my productivity increasing as we go further and further up the abstraction layer. And when it comes to serverless, since I only have to write my application code and don't have to worry about all this infrastructure beneath me, my productivity really starts to take off. And at the same time, the only thing that has stayed constant all the way through has been my cognitive capacity. I mean, I'm 15 years older at this point, being older and wiser and all, so maybe I do have a little bit more brain power, but probably not by that much. And yet I'm building systems that are far more scalable, more robust and more secure than ever. And I'm having to do less and less as my cloud provider is taking care of more and more responsibilities and generally doing a much better job than I can in terms of managing and dealing with the infrastructure. And we've heard the success stories of Lego, iRobot, Basel, and many other companies who have gone on this journey of serverless. And it's easy to get this impression that this whole service thing is just really, really easy, right? And yet, based on what I've seen in my work with clients and the questions I get asked on social media, my blog and email, people are struggling with their migration to serverless all the time. And my worry is that for every person who asks for help, many would have simply given up and go back to managing servers because that's just what they know and what have worked for them in the past. So it's worth taking a minute to understand the failure patterns so that we can hopefully create more success stories with serverless. And I think serverless can be deceptively simple, but there are some hidden dangers unless you know what to look out for. And as we collectively as an industry gone from building everything as monoliths to microservices to now using serverless, along the way, we learned a lot about what it takes to build and run microservices in production, including the need for building observability into the system and all the complexities and problems that comes with building distributed systems. And even though the technology that we use to build our microservices have now shifted to serverless, many of the same problems and challenges are still there. And if anything, we now have more event-driven architectures which have got their own challenges as well. And many companies that have gone straight from building monoliths to serverless Along the way, they also missed out some of the learnings that we took from building microservices, which I find often lead to them making poor decisions when they're designing their serverless architecture. So my name is Yan Chui. I'm an AWS serverless hero and a longtime user for AWS. I've built many systems that run at scale on AWS, including the last couple of years, spending most of my time working with serverless technologies, including migrating a social network to run pretty much entirely on serverless. Nowadays, I spend half of my time working with Lumigo as developer advocate. And for those of you who are not familiar with Lumigo, we are a troubleshooting platform for serverless applications that make it really easy for you to trace complex transactions throughout your architecture and make it easy for you to identify problems along the way. The other half of my time, I work as an independent consultant working with companies all around the world in all kinds of different industries, helping them adopt serverless the right way by offering them training, consulting, as well as sometimes working with clients to deliver features and products. 
In my free time, I also like to produce content in terms of blog posts, video courses, books, and so on. You can check out my courses and books on this link. And right now, I'm working on a new book with Peter Spassky from A Cloud Guru and AJ Nair, who is a project manager on the Lambda team. And this year, I'm also running a couple of in-person as well as virtual workshops. And if you stay on until the end, you can find some discount codes for my courses and for my workshops. So in this talk, I'm going to cover 13 common mistakes people make when they first move to serverless, starting with not letting go of some of the legacy thinking around how they build systems and how they build teams. Oftentimes, when you have companies that are moving to serverless without ever wanting to change the way they operate, they often find that even though they are adopting these latest and greatest technologies, nothing actually gets faster. And you have to remember that any organizations that produce software systems are social technical organisms. And technology alone is not going to be a silver bullet that can fix all the problems that you have with your culture, with how you operate and how you organize yourself. For example, even if you have all your feature teams adopt serverless, individually they can go a lot faster and produce features much, much quickly. But if you have one centralized team that owns the entire AWS environment and the feature teams are not able to deploy the application to AWS environment and not able to access their own AWS accounts and inspect the configuration and deal with any problems in an emergency, then as a whole, you can only move as fast as this one centralized team is able to move. And often the argument here is that, well, but our developers just don't understand AWS and they don't understand how our networking infrastructure is configured. And if that's a problem, then great, because that is a problem that we can actually solve. Since the developers are going to be making all the application level architecture decisions anyway, so if they don't know what they're doing with AWS, then all that's going to happen is that they're going to make mistakes when they design the application that's going to run on AWS and that's going to create problems later on, be it the system not able to scale to your needs or having issues with reliability or cost. So invest in your developers, upskill them and make sure that they understand what they're doing and are able to make the best decisions for what they're building. And how you're used to building systems up to now may not help you get the most out of serverless either. For example, you can have one single Lambda function that implements an entire API and you can do your own routing within your code by inspecting the path and method for the invocation event that comes through. And this is what I would call a fat Lambda function or a monolith function. It's great that it exists as a way for people to lift and shift existing applications by taking, say, an Express app and running it in Lambda and getting some of the benefits of serverless but it's not going to help you get the best performance and security. Whereas the idiomatic way of doing things in Lambda is to actually have one function per endpoint and method with what I would call single purpose functions. And when you compare the two approaches side by side, you are going to end up with more functions with single purpose functions, but provided that you're using the right tools such as the server framework or SAM, you can ensure that all of the related functions have the same prefix so that you can easily find functions that belong to the same API or the same service. And that just by looking at the function names, you're able to work out what business capabilities that you have within your application without having to look into the code for these functions to figure out what are all the different things that you can do. And having tags for authors and team and feature and cost center and so on also helps you identify ownership for functions easily, but also allows you to drill down on the cost for different services and different cost centers easily. And since different endpoints may be require different actions, some may require you to get data from DynamDB, others require permissions to update items or delete items. If you have one function that implements all of the endpoints, that means that function needs to have the permission to do everything and therefore violating the principle of least privilege, which we'll talk about more later on. And in terms of performance, again, different functions may require different dependencies. And if you have one function that implements everything, that means that one function also needs to pull in all the dependencies that's required for every single endpoint and method. And when you look at a cold start performance for a Lambda function by say looking into an X-ray trace, most of the time you'll find that the initialization part, which is the time it takes to initialize your module, 
That's where if you've got dependencies that are loading in the global space, all of that is going to contribute towards your cold start time. So having more dependencies would equate to having a slower cold start time. So having a fat function that requires more dependencies is also going to give you worse cold start performance as well. So the morale here is that you should keep your function simple and keep them single purpose so that they're easier to debug and it's going to give you the best performance and security and provided that you're following some kind of a naming convention, it won't be any harder for you to manage them. And the next point applies to everyone who's using AWS, not just people that are building stuff with serverless, that is having one AWS account for everything. When you have that, you're going to run into all kinds of service limits within AWS. Some of them restrict the number of resources you can provision, such as the number of DynamDB tables, number of regional APIs you can have in API Gateway, S3 buckets, IAM roles, and so on. But then there are also other throughput limits which can impact your application at runtime. For example, the number of API Gateway requests per second, concurrent executions for Lambda functions, or SSM parameter store operations per second, for example. And when these limits are exhausted, your application is going to get throttled and those can impact your user experience. And having multiple accounts also going to give you bulkheads that compartmentalize any security breaches. So if someone accidentally put the AWS credentials for your dev account on the public GitHub repo and attackers gain access to your AWS environment, at least then they're not able to gain access to your real production user data. The approach I normally go with is to have one AWS account per team per environment. And of course, when you do this and within a large organization, you can end up with lots of AWS accounts. And luckily nowadays we have better tools to manage a more complex multi-account AWS environment using AWS organization and control towers. But there are a number of limitations with control tower. For example, there's no real infrastructure as code. A lot of the configurations have to be done in the console. And while you have account factories for you to provision new accounts, based on a CloudFormation template, there's no easy way for you to roll out updates for your landing zones. So check out this open source tool called OrgFormation, which is kind of like an extension to CloudFormation that lets you manage your entire AWS organization using infrastructure as code by provisioning resources using a CloudFormation-like syntax. You can create new accounts using YAML, you can add them to organization units. You can configure SCPs or service control policies. You can even set up password policies, all of that with infrastructure as code. And it supports multi-region as well as the pseudo functions and parameters that allows you to reference resources from different accounts in different regions. If you have an existing AWS organization already configured, you can also run one single command to initialize a new YAML template based on your current configuration so that you can use that to manage and update your AWS organization going forward. Another common mistake that newcomers make is uh, they look at serverless and they think it's so easy and they go straight into building systems without researching and understanding what they're working with first. And a while back, this blog post was doing the rounds on Hacker News and it talked about how serverless is just so expensive and so slow by comparison. And it got 100,000 views in the first three days and credit to the author, after a lot of feedback, he did acknowledge that a lot of the cost that he saw was because he was using API Gateway in a fairly high throughput system. And most of the cost he saw was associated with API Gateway and he could have saved most of that cost by using ALB instead. And I think Joe Emerson sums this up very nicely in that a lot of these uh, serverless lessons learned posts that we read on Medium and other places reflects a common trend that we often spend more time doing work and less time researching. And if we spend more time researching first and get a better understanding of the tools that we're working with, then we are unlikely to make those mistakes. Many of these lessons learned have been published and wrote about by other people already. That said, the platforms themselves, they do need to take some of the responsibility for not educating their users on how to choose between different services. For example, when do you use API Gateway versus ALB, or when you need a queue, do I use SNS, SQS, Kinesis, or manage the Kafka? As someone put to me recently, the AWS is like this massive buffet menu that lets you choose whatever you want. There's no guidance on what you should eat in what situations. For example, if you're doing workouts, maybe you want to eat more chicken. <laughs> 
and if you're trying to lose weight, maybe stay away from the desserts. And when you're looking for a cue between different parts of your system, how do you choose between Kinesis, SQS, SNS, and EventBridge? So I put this table together myself that outlines the main difference between different aspects of, of these services to help me pick the right integration service between two microservices based on the needs I have for ordering, for concurrency, control, and so on. And if you're doing research for your application or certain aspects of serverless, I've written about serverless extensively. At this point, I have written almost 200 articles on different aspects of serverless development, which you can find all of them in one place. And the Jeremy Daily has also published a weekly newsletter that collects all the different articles from all around the serverless community. If you haven't subscribed to his newsletter, you definitely should. So moving on, the next mistake is uh, not using a deployment framework. And there are plenty of deployment frameworks out there already. And I wrote a blog post a while back that compared some of the more popular frameworks around in terms of how customizable they are and how opinionated they are. But the most important thing is you should use one of these existing frameworks rather than building your own because all of them will be better battle tested and building your own deployment framework is exactly the kind of heavy lifting that we wish to get away from by moving to serverless. And mistake number five is what I've called console driven development. I've seen this a few times where teams will be using the AWS console to develop the application. This is a terrible idea. You have no source control and you absolutely, absolutely need to have source control. Creating an editing Lambda function in the console is great for prototyping an idea, but eventually you do need to pull them into source control. Another mistake I've seen a few times now is where you will have one repo for every single Lambda function you have, because while every single Lambda function can be scaled independently, can be deployed and updated independently, and therefore you end up with one repo per function, right? And of course, you quickly find out that this is not going to scale because you're going to end up with thousands of functions and you end up with all of these repos. Every single one of them needs its own CI/CD pipeline and all these other tools around it. The two approach that works is either having a modern repo where you put everything into a single repo broken up into different deployment units and for every single one of them have a folder in the root, but then you have a single CI/CD pipeline that deploys everything or you have one repo per service. And that's the approach that I normally go with, where every single microservice has got its own repo and all the functions that have to work together as part of that service, they belong in the same repo and they're deployed with one CI/CD pipeline. So I compared the two approaches in a blog post a while back, so feel free to go and check it out afterwards. And here's a quick mind map uh, that I put together for Yabo, the social network I worked at before, where you can quickly identify a number of distinct features in the system, such as having a timeline feature, which is very much like what you find in other social networks like Twitter and Facebook. And then there's search notifications, suggestions, and so on. All of these features that your system offers is a good starting point for identifying those service boundaries. And these features all evolve around a number of entities or concepts within your domain, like users, relationships, brands, content, and so on. So this can be helpful in identifying your service boundaries. Each one can then be managed by a separate microservice and implemented using the most appropriate set of technologies like databases, queues, streams, and so on. For example, to store the relationship between different users in a way that make it easy for you to do complex queries like finding second or third degree connections or finding people in your extended network with similar interests, you may want to use a graph database like Neo4j or Amazon Neptune. And every microservice gets its own repo and all the functions that have to work together, whether it's part of an API or maybe they're doing some background data fetching or synchronizing data across different regions or databases or whatever, they all belong together as part of that microservice because they all have to work together to deliver the feature. And every service, or therefore every repo, has a single CI-CD pipeline that deploys everything together in a single stack. And even if we have resources like DynamDB tables, if they're only used and are only relevant to this particular microservice, then we should also include them in the same stack and get deployed together with your Lambda functions. 
and to prevent accidental data loss if some accidentally delete the stack, you can always set deletion policy to retain for these tables and queues that contains user data. And mistake number seven evolves around secrets and how we manage them. The rule of thumb here is that your secrets should never be in plain text in your functions environment variables. So this is where I see a lot of companies do the right thing, at least on the first part, where they will store those secrets in Secrets Manager or in SSM Primer Store and make sure that they are encrypted with KMS. However, when they're using tools like the Server Framework and they're referencing those secrets at deployment time, those secrets are fetched from SSM Primer Store or from Secrets Manager and then baked into the Cloud Formation template in plain text so that at runtime, they are available in your function's environment variable in plain text, which make it easy for your function to use them, but it also makes it easy for attackers to steal them as well. And we've seen many real-world attacks against the NPM ecosystem, and in some cases, attackers would compromise existing NPM packages, or maybe they will, in this particular case, publish NPM packages with a different but similar sounding name to real NPM packages as bait, and what you would do, it will steal your environment variables at runtime. So what you should be doing here instead is have your function fetch those secrets at runtime during a cold start, cache them, and then invalidate that cache every couple of minutes. And remember, attackers is most likely gonna be looking in the environment variables for sensitive data. So when you fetch those secrets at cold start, you don't want to put them into environment variables in plain text, otherwise you will defeat the whole purpose. And what you should do, and this is something that the MIDI middleware engine gives you for JavaScript Lambda functions, via two built-in middlewares to fetch secrets from SSM as well as from Secrets Manager, where you can configure the middlewares to store the decrypted secrets in the context object instead, so that your function can access them in plain text via the context object, which will make it much harder for attackers to steal them from your application. And if you're using SSM Primer Store, Keep in mind that there's a default throughput limit of 40 ops per second. You can, of course, switch to a higher throughput tier where you can get up to 1,000 ops per second, but you also start paying for the use of SSM Primer Store. And mistake number eight is not following least privilege principle. And unfortunately, this one is rather common where we use stars in our IAM permissions. And even some of the official tutorials and examples I find from AWS would use stars in the IAM policies. And instead, what you should be doing is to have IAM policies that are tailored to just the operation and resource that your functions need to access. And then you should have one role per function so that again, every function is given the permission to access just the resources they need to do their job. And mistake number nine is not having delta queues for your application. Lambda invocations are classified into asynchronous invocations, synchronous invocations like API Gateway, and polling, which is reserved for SQS, Kinesis, and DynamoDB streams. And for async invocations, by default, Lambda would retry failed invocations twice, then capture those persistently failing invocations into the delta queue so that you don't lose them in the event that your function keeps on failing for some events. And nowadays, you also have Lambda destinations, which supports both asynchronous invocations as well as stream-based invocations. The advantage of Lambda destinations over normal DLQ is that with the DLQ, it only captures the invocation event, but with Lambda destinations, you get a lot more information about what actually happened, including the request context, the response context and the response payload, in this case, would include the error message and the stack trace for the last invocation that failed, which allows you to quickly figure out what the problem was without having to then check your logs to see what happened when your function tried to process this event and why it fails persistently. And once you enable Lambda destinations, you also see in the monitoring tab for your function that you now have a Destination delivery failures metric, which is important as it tells you when Lambda is not able to forward those events to the specified destination. This could be because of permissions or maybe it's getting throttled, but whatever the case, you should have this alarm set up when you're using Lambda destinations so that you don't end up losing events. It's worth pointing out that when there is a failure, Lambda would retry. However, eventually it has to stop retrying failed deliveries. 
which is why you need to alert yourself so that you can deal with any failures here quickly. And mistake number 10 is having too much or too little concurrencies from your Lambda function. The problem is that Lambda scales automatically and can scale very quickly. However, if you're dealing with some legacy downstream system that just can't scale quite as much, then you can find yourself generating too much load for the downstream system to handle. For example, if you're using SNS with Lambda, then every message that gets published to SNS is going to trigger a Lambda invocation. And if all of them is talking to some downstream systems, then this can overwhelm the downstream system when you have a massive spike in traffic. And so looking at the different queues that we can have in AWS, in terms of how you can control concurrency, SNS and EventBridge are very similar in that they're going to fan out the number of messages right away. Whereas with Kinesis, you can have a precise control of your concurrency with the number of shards in the stream. So if we have five shards in the Kinesis stream, then you know exactly how many concurrent executions for the subscribe lambda functions you will have at any moment in time. By default, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. You can configure the subscription so that you can have up to 10 concurrent executions for every single shard in the stream. But nonetheless, it's about having that precise control for the concurrency of your function. So on the two extremes of having either maximum throughput with SNS or having precise control with Kinesis, depending on how quickly you want auto scaling to happen, you may want to consider using DynamoDB streams or using SQS instead. Another important consideration here is in terms of ordering and the retry semantics you have. If you need to guarantee ordering, then your only options becomes either Kinesis, where you can preserve ordering by shard, or using SQS FIFO queues. And number 11 is not understanding how cold starts work. And a common misconception here is that you experience only one cold start every time you deploy a new version of your function, which of course is not the case because cold starts happen on the first request to every single new container that gets created. And I think this misconception stems from the fact that we don't have a very well developed vocabulary that distinguishes a function, which is the code, the permission, and the configuration, a concurrent execution, or a container that's running an instance of your function, and an invocation on this function. And if you think in terms of the terminologies from OO, a function is a class, or a concurrent execution is an instance of that class, whereas an invocation is a method call against an instance. And Lambda automatically scales the number of concurrent executions based on traffic. And as much as possible, it tries to reuse existing containers to minimize the number of cold starts you will see. So after a function has been deployed, a request will come in, a container is created to serve this request, and this invocation is a cold start. While we're processing the first event, another request comes in. Because our container is still busy, Lambda will scale out and create a new container to handle this second request which will also be a cold start. And as time goes on, no new request comes in for a little while, but then we get two requests at the same time. And this time around, Lambda can reuse the two containers that it already created. So both invocations are executed against these existing containers, so no cold starts. But what if another two comes in while we're busy processing these two invocations? Well, in that case, Lambda is gonna scale out again and create two more containers and both of which would be cold starts. Because remember, the first invocation on a container is always a cold start. And some more time passes and nothing happens. And when we get another request, it's gonna get routed to one of the existing containers, followed by another one shortly after. In this particular case, I've used the same container, but the platform might well decide to do something different. And if a container is idle for some time, then the garbage collected automatically and the resources are then freed up to be used elsewhere, even if it's the very last container that's currently running this particular function. An easy way to illustrate this is to use something like a child's proxy to generate a bunch of requests against an API gateway Lambda function. And when a concurrency is set to one, you can see that only the first request is significantly slower than the rest, which tells us that it's a cold start. And that's one out of 100 requests being a cold start, which is acceptable. But then when we change the concurrency to 10, then all of a sudden it paints a very different picture. Now the first 10 requests are all cold starts. And the point here is that the frequency of cold starts is determined by your traffic pattern. 
And while you may have heard of a lambda warmer where you have a cron job that paints your lambda functions to keep them warm, they are ineffective once you have more than one concurrent executions because there's no way for you to target specific containers. And the way to really think about cold starts is to think of it in terms of both frequency as well as duration. And since the frequency of cold starts is a function of your traffic pattern, and it's not something that you can actually control, generally speaking, because it all depends on when users decide to use your system. And oftentimes, cold starts is just not an issue when you have a steady traffic pattern anyway. Take iRobot for example. They have a system which receives pings from their robots and the traffic is predictable based on the size of the fleet of robots they have, which grows steadily over time, but predictable nonetheless. So all of the containers are kept warm by the traffic itself. On the other hand, as something like the zone, which is a sports streaming platform, we had a completely different traffic pattern where we see a lot of spikes as users all flood into the system just a few seconds before, say, a football match is about to start. Or for food delivery services such as Just Eat, they also experience spikes in traffic around lunch and dinner time. Both of these use cases are bad for cold starts because every spike will essentially cause many containers to be created to handle the new requests and each new container equates to a cold start. So if you're thinking about reducing cold starts, then focus on reducing the duration. And since we can't do anything about the spikes themselves, and therefore the frequency of cold starts, so instead we need to minimize the duration of cold starts so that they fall within our acceptable latency range. And since the last reinvent, there's also a new feature now from Lambda called provision concurrency, which allows us to configure the number of containers that we want to keep around. So when we know a spike is going to come, we can dial up the number of containers so that when a spike does come, there's no cold starts involved. And the great thing about provision concurrency is that it works seamlessly with on-demand concurrency. So if there's more traffic than your provision concurrency is able to handle, then automatically Lambda is going to scale out by creating new containers on demand. And of course, when it does that, you're going to see cold starts again. If you want to find out more about provision concurrency, how it works, check out this blog post I wrote when the feature was announced. But remember, it's also not a silver bullet. It comes with its own caveats. And whilst it is a very powerful tool, you should only use it if and only if you have a cold start problem that prevents you from being to use Lambda for some workload. And you shouldn't use it by default on all of your functions. And moving on, Another common mistake I see people make is how they handle RDS connections. The default RDS configurations are bad for Lambda because the max number of connections is very low. On MySQL, it's like 100. When your Lambda containers are garbage collected, they're not timed out quickly on the server side. So you very quickly run into the max number of open connections. And many of the client libraries that you use will try to create more than one connections per container, which your function just doesn't need because with Lambda, you only process one event at a time. So there is no concurrency within one execution. Jeremy Davis got a great blog post on this from, well, over two years ago and talk about the different things you want to change configuration wise, including the wait timeout and the interactive timeout and change them to match the idle timeout for Lambda, which is about 10 minutes. Also increase the max connections setting and set the client side socket pool size to one so that every container will only open one connection to the RDS server. Or you can use the serverless MySQL package that Jeremy has published for Node.js functions. Right now, the RDS proxy service is also in preview. And once it's generally available, then we'll be able to use this service to sit between our Lambda functions and RDS database so that it can manage and scale out the database connections for us. And the last mistake I want to talk about is not building any observability into your application to begin with. Even with service applications, things can still go wrong. And when they do, they're going to cause user impact. And you want to minimize the mean time to recovery which requires you to have visibility into what's actually happening in the system. And it all begins with being able to identify problems quickly. And so that you can minimize the mean time to discovery that you have a problem without having to wait for customers to complain before you notice something's wrong. And instead, you want the system to be able to pick up that something's wrong and then send pager alerts to you so that you can go and investigate what is the root cause, what's actually happening. The question that I get asked a lot is, what alerts should I have? 
Well, it depends on what it is you're building and what services that you're using from AWS. But here's a couple of uh, alerts you should normally have as a good starting point. If you're using Lambda, then you want to set up alerts against the error rate, which is the percentage of invocations that ends with an error, and it's something that you can calculate using metric expressions in CloudWatch. And since we don't expect our functions to get throttled, we also want to set up alarms against the throttle count. And for any functions that are using delta queues or using Lambda destinations, make sure that you have alerts against the DLQ error, as well as the destination delivery failure as metric. And for functions that are doing event processing with Kinesis, set up an alarm against the iterator age, which tells you the time between the event being recorded in Kinesis and it being picked up by a Lambda function. So if your function are failing repeatedly, or you're just simply not able to keep up with the traffic, then iterator age is going to go up and you should get notified so that you can then do something, maybe increasing the concurrency per shard to increase your throughput. And one alarm that always set up is alarm against the regional concurrency metric. So if the current concurrency limit for my region is a thousand, then I'll set this to be about 80% of that number so that I know when I'm exceeding the 80% of my regional concurrency limit, then it's time to go and ask for a raise. If you're building APIs, your API gateway, then you want to set up alarms against the tail latency as well as the success rate and the 4xx and 5xx error rates as well. For SQS queues, there's a metric called the approximate age of the oldest message, which again tells you when your processor is falling behind the traffic and your backlog is building up. For step functions, set up alarms against the any failure conditions, failed executions, throttled or timed out. And those are just a handful of the alarms that I normally have in my serverless application. And when you have an event-driven system where messages are getting passed from one function to a queue, picked up by another function and put into another queue and so on, then it's also worth monitoring and alerting on that message flow rate so that you know for every step of your pipeline, there's going to be one-to-one -one ratio between messages coming in and messages going into the outgoing queue. A lot of these alarms are fairly standard, so you can actually codify this and I have published a CloudFormation macro that allows you to auto-generate these CloudWatch alarms for you based on your configuration and what AWS resources you have configured in your CloudFormation stack. And that's the 13 common mistakes I see companies make when they first move to serverless. Thank you guys very much for your time and attention today. As I mentioned earlier, I spend most of my time working as an independent consultant, working with clients all around the world. So if you want to find out how we can work together, then please go to theburningmonk.com slash hire-me to see how we may be able to work together. And as I mentioned, I'm also running a series of workshops around how to build production-ready service applications, which comes in both in-person format, but also available as a virtual workshop and you can use this code to get 100 euro off my workshops. And the same code can be used to get 20% off my video courses on Lambda best practices as well as AWS step functions. Again, thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, my blog, and all the usual places that developers hang out. I'll see you guys next time.